I have shared with you my personal testimony when I interviewed myself on uh, the problem that I had with bipolar disorder and how I have managed to live without any medication, completely controlling the condition by following a totally natural diet. Now I'd like to share with you exactly what bipolar is in case you're not sure what it is, you may not never have heard of it. Um, when I was diagnosed, they basically told me that I had manic depression, which is just the olden days name for bipolar today. I have made a study of bipolar disorder and manic depression probably for the last 25 years. I've read extensively on how nutrition affects the mind and emotions. I have had psychiatrists not tell me directly, but I have had other people saying that their psychiatrist says there is no cure for manic depression. It's a chemical imbalance of the brain and it cannot be corrected. Well, if that's the case, why are they giving them medication? Um, they're saying that there's no cure for it. There's, you have to be on medication. Now, of course, if somebody doesn't study diet, it's not part of their curriculum. They never pick up a book on nutrition. It never occurs to them. Clearly, they're not going to know anything about diet and how it affects your brain. Uh, if they study diseases of, of uh, the body, diseases of the mind, uh, behavioral problems in, in, in humans, if that's all they study and how to treat it with medication, that's all they're going to know. So when you're dealing with a psychiatrist, they know how to deal, they know how to treat people with manic depression with drugs. They don't investigate diet. It's not in their curriculum at college or university. They don't even think in that area. Um, so to say that something is incurable and cannot be treated with diet when you know nothing about diet seems rather odd. Um, having had the condition myself, I'm going to read you all the symptoms and um, having dealt with dozens and dozens of people with the condition. Um, I can tell you categorically that diet plays a major role and uh, you can con totally and utterly control bipolar disorder with diet, exercise and spiritual balance. I've done it and many, many people I've dealt with over the years have been able to do it. I'm not advocating you stop using the medication, I'm advocating that you get your diet and lifestyle in order and then find a doctor who is health conscious, who is aware that diet plays a role and ask him to help you wean yourself off the medication. Just a quick search on the internet gives us over 8 million results when you type in bipolar, just the word bipolar, eight, over 8 million different results that you can look up. Clearly, we're not going to do that tonight. What I want to do is look at some of the sites, and I'm going to take a look at one called bipolar.com. So if you go there, it says, what is bipolar disorder? Manic depression can cause extreme shifts in moves. Learning about causes of these shifts and available bipolar disorder treatments can help people lead a relatively normal life. Let's go there. What is bipolar disorder? Right. Everyone has feelings of happiness. Now, I'm reading this so that you can understand that this is what the general consensus is. This is how it's diagnosed, okay? And uh, I'll take you through a test that they ask you for which I ticked yes for every single one of them if I think back on how my body was at the time. Everyone has feelings of happiness and sadness once in a while. Feeling high and feeling low are part of life, obviously. But for someone with bipolar disorder, sometimes called manic depression, these feelings can be extreme. These ups and downs can be too much for a person to cope with. They can interfere with daily life and they can sometimes they can even be dangerous. The ups and downs. One day you may feel so depressed you can't get out of bed. Work may seem impossible. On another day you may feel great and full of endless energy. You feel like you're getting a lot done. But other people might think that you are doing is what you are doing is dangerous and out of control. Bipolar disorder is a lifelong condition. It can be hard for healthcare providers to diagnose, but it's nothing to be embarrassed about. Learning about more and how to manage it can help your condition. 
Right. They're basically, they're saying there are four types of bipolar disorder. Bipolar 1 disorder. In this type, you have at least one episode of mania or mixed mood and often experience depression too. In between, your mood may be normal. Sometimes your mood swings happen when the seasons change. Bipolar 2 in this type, if you have at least one episode of depression, at least one period of hypomania, hypomania is a milder form of mania. In between, your mood may be normal. Sometimes your mood swings happen when the seasons change. Hardly sounds very different. Cyclothymic disorder. This is a milder form of bipolar disorder. You go back and forth between mild depression and slightly elevated mood, but your mood swings are shorter and less severe. Many people with cyclothymic disorder go on to have a stronger type of bipolar disorder. This doesn't happen to everyone, though. Bipolar disorder, not otherwise specified. It's when you do not fit into the types mentioned above. The feelings of bipolar disorder vary from person to person. So you can see from this, you don't have to be having more than one period of mania to be classified as bipolar. Now, if I look back on my life and the periods of mania, they were definitely very regular, probably at least every month, and in between, lots of depression. Um, I didn't get to doing everything, anything totally crazy like in that movie, I think it's called something about Mr. Jones with Richard Gere where he walks on the roof of the building. I mean, that's really going over the edge. I have found over the years that once you've been on medication and you come off the medication, if you just stop it and don't change your lifestyle and diet, your manic periods can be far more violent than they used to be. Um, so you have to be very careful in coming off the medication. You have to make sure that you monitor it, but you have to make sure that you are exercising and that you are um, eating correctly. Let's just take a look at some other things. Um, people with bipolar disorder may find that their mood swings are triggered by things that happen in their life. Unpleasant, sad or even happy events can make time of depression or mania more likely. Triggers also called stresses are anything that may help cause a mood swing. Not everyone's trigger is the same. Some common triggers, not having regular sleep schedule. Now, I find that with me, um, in the past, when I've had not enough sleep, um, definitely would trigger an episode of uh, initially mania. Very definitely. Even now, I could kind of don't have a great day if I don't have enough sleep. Most people don't. But you start getting pretty weird thoughts going on in your head. So sleep, lack of sleep could do that. Misusing alcohol or drugs. I didn't have to misuse alcohol or drugs to trigger an episode of depression. All I needed was one glass of wine. And today, all I need is a glass of wine to get depressed the next day. Um, it, sometimes it takes two or three days for the depression to hit me, but one glass of wine is enough. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that now. Well, probably let me tell you now, just in case I move on to something else and, and leave it out. Um, Barbara Reed Stitt is was a, a new, um, probation officer for um, a municipal area in Cleveland, Ohio. And she worked with juvenile, juvenile delinquents and um, um, criminals. And basically what she did was she studied their history, their dietary history, their behavior, and how diet affected them while they were in prison, and did some studies where she removed refined and processed sugar, for example. She also removed dairy from their diet. And what she found, which was fascinating, is that you can have what's called reactive hyperglycemia, um, which can trigger episodes of mania and depression, for example. But what she found specifically was that when you put refined sugar into a child's body or an adult's body or alcohol for that matter, you, you have a condition where you get this, and some people you get reactive hyperglycemia where it's violent mood swings and they'll get very aggressive. In other people it's not as bad, but in fact what would happen is when you have this reactive hyperglycemia from alcohol or refined sugar, blood sugar drops really very quickly. And as it drops very quickly, the body goes into a state of panic. First it shoots up, you overproduce insulin, and then your blood sugar comes down too low. And as it comes down too low, 
The area of the brain that controls moral behavior, planning, and forethought shuts down. And so the area of the brain that makes you responsible, makes you behave in a responsible way, in a moral way, is shut down. And this aggression takes over. So you may become immoral, you may become incredibly aggressive, you could become incredibly violent. Um, I would say with, with manic depression or bipolar disorder, all of those, all of the above can happen with our one episode. I know for myself that I be, would become very aggressive and very violent um, and very destructive. Um, fortunately, didn't get lead into the immoral side, but with many people it has. And they've had to carry those scars and the burden of bad choices they've made in that condition. And so blood sugar has a very, very powerful effect on the way our brain works. And I know certainly with myself and many people I've discussed this with, um, that bipolar disorder can be triggered by the blood sugar. In fact, I'd say it's the most powerful trigger of, of, of any of the manic and depressive episodes, which either refined sugar or alcohol. So for anybody with a history or been diagnosed or anybody who is recognizing these symptoms, you simply cannot eat refined sugar. You can eat fresh fruit as much as you like. You can eat dried fruit as much as you like, but you stay away from sugar unless you want to live in the drugs for the rest of your life. And the same goes for alcohol. I cannot touch it. So... Um, you know, when people offer me a drink, I say, thank you very much, but I don't drink. Oh, come on, have a drink. No, I'm allergic to alcohol. Are you an alcoholic? Well, almost. I just become quite crazy and want to kill myself and everybody around me when I drink alcohol. Not immediately, but in the days that follow. So very often you could find, for example, in families where these family murders that the father or the mother is suffering from, it has alcohol, goes on one of these crazy binges, does crazy dangerous stuff, and, and this could have been controlled if they probably understood a little bit more about how they work. Now the interesting thing about that I found with people that have these um, incredible mood swings, those that have been diagnosed and even those that have been undiagnosed in children and adults alike, there's some common denominators that I see running through in every single one of these people I've spoken to. They are people that talk fast, people that think fast, there's a lot going on in their heads. They tend to be on the go all the time. Typical attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. They daydream a lot. Um, they, if they don't eat, they lose weight very fast. They um, get bored pretty easily. They find most people that speak in public, it's difficult for them to listen to people because they get bored quickly. They want to be doing the thing. They can have like addictive type of behavior, particularly with food. They, they, they either love, they usually love food, but love particular things. And particularly, they love sweet things. Like I was. I was a sugarholic. I could drink two tins of sweetened condensed milk straight after each other. I could eat two slabs of chocolate. It was like I had no limit to how much sugar I could put into my body. And I know that if I'd started on the route to alcohol, it would have ended up that I had, would have been an alcoholic. My father was an alcoholic. My grandfather was an alcoholic. And that's the other thing I found with people with bipolar disorder. There's alcoholism very 99.9% .9 of the time I have found. In fact, I haven't spoken to anybody with bipolar or manic depression who doesn't have an alcoholic in the background. It's either a parent or a grandparent or a, an aunt or an uncle. There's somebody in the family who's an alcoholic. And you'll find, like in our family, there are four kids. My father was an alcoholic. My grandfather was an alcoholic. But I'm the only one that responded with this kind of behavioral problem. I mean, neither of my brothers nor my sister has the problem in this area. Out of my three children, I'd say one of my children definitely has a problem with refined sugar and alcohol. It does trigger rages in her. And so very definitely, and even though I never consumed alcohol, the fact that my father was was enough for that genetic predisposition to be there. So the genetic predisposition is always there. So in a sense, a psychiatrist could be right. You're never cured of the condition. You're always controlling it. And it's like being an alcoholic. Once you're an alcoholic, drinking alcohol just triggers alcoholic binges. So um, you, you really can't go down that route. I do on occasions have had stuff with a bit of sugar in it, and I now know how to control it. I know I need to increase the amount of fats in my diet. I need to increase my exercise. 
I know I need to be eating a lot more fruit if I've had something with sugar in, especially the next day, because it sets up the cycle where I start to crave sweet things, like I'll have, you know, I'll go out and it's somebody's birthday and I'll have a bit of cheesecake. I never finish the slice because I find it too sweet now, but it sets up the cycle where the very next day I want something sweet again, and then I'm, it's fruit is not giving it to me, and then I have to eat a lot of fruit, lots of dates, um, raisins, really sweet, sticky stuff, and then it kind of by the second or third day, I'm under control and I've lost my craving for sweet things. So I find that sugar does trigger the craving for refined and processed sugar. So you, it's something you need to watch out for. Um, the, the, the thing with, with, with bipolar disorder is I have spoken to as I said, many, many people, not one of them ever ever found does not crave either alcohol or candy or sweets or cookies, something with refined and processed sugar. And I actually spoke to the um, Bipolar Disorder Association in Johannesburg probably about 10 or 12 years ago. And I found it so it's surprising that this group of people actually seem to revel in their condition. And this is going to maybe get a lot of flack from some people, but they enjoyed the fact that they had this diagnosis and they were different and they had the label and they were on this medication and they formed this association rather than try to find solutions for their problem in this association they got together to bemoan the fact or to kind of almost rejoice in the fact that they had this condition and they all had it and so they would get various speakers in to speak on anything from you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll. I happened to come and they asked me to speak about diet because somebody had heard that I was bipolar disorder. So I asked them, it was a group of about 50, maybe 100 people. I asked them to raise their hands if they loved sweet things. Well, it was actually quite funny. It was like both arms from all the people just went straight up like, this is it. We're the sugarholic association, I could have called them. And what fascinated me even more was in speaking to the people afterwards, most of them were not prepared to stop eating sugar or consuming alcohol. They would far rather have carried on with the medication, which I find surprising because we'll take a look at some of the side effects of the medication. There, there are two types of people with bipolar. There's those that enjoy their condition, they enjoy the medication, they enjoy talking about it, they enjoy talking about the doctors they see, they part of that group may not enjoy it but they've just accepted that they're going to be on this drug and that's it and then there's the group who don't want to be on the drug want to be off it they want to get well and they prepare to eat glass if they have to um, and so if you would like help and want to be able to control the condition changing your diet and lifestyle are very important okay number one make sure you're talking to god on a daily basis because you're not going to get through this without his help okay Number two, exercise on a daily basis for at least 30 minutes a day. Vigorous, good, solid exercise. Walking, running, cycling, swimming. Make sure it's regular, rhythmical, and you're working. Your heart rate is going up, but not beyond where it should be. And if you don't know where it should be, in my book, Perfect Health in the Natural Way and Perfect Weight, I explain clearly in the exercise on, on a chapter on exercise what you should be doing. Number three, very important Get rid of refined and processed sugar and alcohol from your diet. Not only does it make your blood sugar go up and down like this, but it destroys B vitamins in large quantities. And B vitamins are what make the brain work efficiently together with glucose. You've got to have glucose and B vitamins. And if you don't have B vitamins with glucose, your body is going to go and find B vitamins. Now, refined and processed sugar and alcohol have no B vitamins in them. So they just actually rob the body elsewhere of B vitamins to try and get them to utilize it. You can't use glucose without the B vitamins. So to use the glucose, it's got to find them. When you rob your body of glucose, you find you're not going to cope with stress because stress needs lots of B vitamins. But more than anything is your brain suffering from a deficiency of B vitamins starts to get this chemical imbalance because you're not giving it the right chemicals. In this instance, B vitamins. So that's part of it. Part of it has to do with the B vitamins, part of it has to do with serotonin levels. Very often they'll put you onto medication that raises your serotonin levels. Serotonin can be raised by sunlight and exercise. And you must be exercising outdoors. It's important that you don't wear glasses over your eyes so that you can 
Expose your eyes to the uh, UV rays so that you, you can regulate serotonin and melatonin levels. If you don't regulate serotonin and melatonin levels with natural sunlight, you're not going to be able to sleep and you're going to be tired all day. So it's important that you get sunlight. I find it best first thing in the morning. It's important that you get it without glasses on your eyes. No contact lenses. Remove them. If you're as blind as a bat, at least sit on your veranda in the sunlight for like an hour a day. Do some work out there. Um, if you can't see a book to read it, um, talk to God for an hour with your eyes open. Find something to do. Sunlight has a very powerful effect on depression. In our book, uh, Take Control, Mark and I explain in two chapters very clearly how sunlight, exercise and diet affect the, the brain with depression particularly. But to regulate serotonin, you can do it completely with exercise, sunlight, without glasses on your eyes, and a natural diet with no, no refined sweetener. Don't replace the refined sweeteners with artificial sweeteners because they mess up the hormonal system, which in an indirect way controls brain function as well. You've got to make sure you have regular sleep. You shouldn't be using, it says you're misusing alcohol or drugs. In my opinion, you shouldn't be using alcohol or drugs of any description. Okay. It says yeah, that bipolar mood swings may be triggered by stopping your medication. They may very well be. And in my opinion, you should never start with the medication. But you've got to sort out your lifestyle and diet. You can't not take medication and then just be a crazy person and destroy your life and other people around you. Um, having thyroid problems and other medical conditions. Thyroid problems um, are caused by, from a dietary perspective, things like gluten intolerance, not enough essential fatty acids, Incorrect diet and lifestyle, not enough sunlight, for example, stress. Some people find that uh, episodes can be triggered like seasonal changes, holidays, illness, disagreements with families or friends, problems at work, the death of a loved one, marriage, um, starting college, starting a new job, anything that creates stress. They suggest that you need to keep track of mood moods and triggers, avoiding triggers. I mean, avoiding triggers is like avoiding life. Uh, keeping track of keeping track of me for me to keep track if I had done stuff like that it would make me completely obsessed with my condition and I think the problem is that you've got these kind of obsessive type of people now obsessing about their obsession so you know, I just I, I don't want to live there I don't want to be there and I know there are many people who don't want to be in that place it's very important that you sort out your diet your lifestyle and your exercise this this website, what, what shocks me more than anything else, bipolar.com, you go there, you think, great, this is a great website, I wonder who's paying for it. Now, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page here, well, GSK, Glaxo, Smith Klein, United States. It's a large pharmaceutical company, they produce medication to help you control your bipolar disorder. So now you're getting advice from somebody who's got a lot to gain by you using their medication. It's very sad that virtually all the websites I'm going on to that seem to have a very decent sort of look to them and a layout to them and seem to have a lot of information are paid for by pharmaceutical companies. And in my opinion, that's very sad and uh, I would rather ignore what they have to say. I want to take a look at some of the side effects of the medication. Let's just take a look at that. Lithium pharmacology. Um, treatment. Right, so we know that lithium is a drug that is used by um, to control the chemical imbalance in the brain. It's one of the one of the drugs that is used, and uh, it's uh, got a, a very long history. It's been used for a long time. In fact, at one point it was out of fashion, and now it's being used again. Some of the side effects are um, Epstein's anom anomaly, which is a, a cardiac what they call a cardiac defect. Um, which can occur if used in the first trimester of pregnancy, which is when you don't know that you're pregnant. So it could be caused uh, it, it, while you're pregnant. So it's very important that you not take any medication if you are thinking of or planning to become pregnant. 
uh, it's, it's, it is teratogenic, which means that it can affect the fetus in your womb, in that, especially in that first month. Um, it's known to have long-term side effects on the kidneys, including um, diabetes, distortion of the bladder and the urinary tract, um, long-term physical and behavioral effects extending beyond the first generation of uh, lithium is known to be responsible and for significant weight gain, acne with scarring, thinning of hair, pronounced tremor, usually in the hands but extending to the lips and the tongue when a person is stressed or after prolonged use. Now to me that is not a cure. I mean I come from an overweight family and I was diagnosed when I was underweight. I certainly didn't want to go down this route. But it's so weird that the weight issue was the thing. I wasn't concerned about, you know, uh, an unborn child or um, acne or, you know, kidney problems or diabetes or bladder problems. It was just, you know, the weight kind of issue. There are side effects. These aren't the only ones. You have to do a search of probably five or six sites to get you know, complete um, list of all the side effects. Uh, let's take a look. Hold on, let me get out of Wikipedia. Um, there we go. We've got um, nausea, stomach cramps, diarrhea, thirstiness, muscle weakness, feelings of being somewhat tired, dazed or sleepy. And that's why a lot of people tell me that they don't like the way they feel. They feel distanced. They feel emotionally numb. They feel detached from the people around them when they're on the medication. Mild hand tremor may emerge as the doses increase. The effects are normally minimal, but some of the initial side effects may... Okay, what else? Many drink more fluids than usual without always being aware of it. Urinate more frequently. Others gain weight. Weight gain often can be controlled with proper diet. Now suddenly diet comes in to control your weight, but not somehow to control your brain. Um, what else? Physiological changes in the kidneys. Some lithium treated patients. Uh, frequency of urination should be reported to your physician. Could be psoriasis, acne, uh, water retention. Uh, let's have a look. You've got to have regular blood tests reporting changes in diet, exercise and occurrence of illness. Toxic levels of lithium in the blood can cause vomiting. Severe diarrhea, extreme thirst, weight loss, muscle twitching, abnormal muscle movement, slurred speech, blurred vision, dizziness, confusion, stupor, or pulse irregularity. Sudden physical or mental changes would be reported to the doctor immediately. Right, so, you know, it's just, it's not like it's a cure. There are other medications that people are put on. Lithium is not the only one, but it's the most common. I suggest if you're on any medication, get onto the website, look at the side effects, look at the side effects on at least five different websites because you'll find that some will have four websites, four side effects and another one will have 40. So just they're, they're not all the same on every website and make sure, try and get one that's pretty independent. Most of the side effects of medication are funded by pharmaceutical companies, but at least they're listing them because legally they have to. Um, Dietary changes, as I said, you've got to get the sugar out, you've got to get the alcohol out, and you've got to start exercising, start talking to God, and make sure you're getting sunlight. Um, further than that, I suggest you read our book, Take Control. There's two really extensive chapters on how food and lifestyle affect the brain. Um, I want to encourage you to start this path. Don't stop your medication. Get a doctor to wean you off it. As your health improves, so you, he'll be able to reduce your levels. If you've been on medication for longer than six months, it's probably going to take you six months to get off it. Um, because you need to reduce it gradually and maybe eventually be taking every second day or smaller dosages over a period of time. Uh, I would really just want to encourage you that there, there is hope. Um, but you need to do this wisely, not irresponsibly. Your diet must first change. You must be exercising and only like, you know, months into it do you start looking at reducing the medication. If you've not started taking the medication and you've recognized some of these symptoms, change your diet and your exercise and lifestyle today. I know with me, it was an immediate improvement. Literally within days, I could, I could feel the change from having fresh fruit instead of refined sugar. 
but it took three months of really healthy eating for my appetite to calm down, for the food not to control me, and for me to stop craving sweet things in this obsessive way. Um, and I don't crave things with refined sugar in them unless I start having something with sugar which triggers me again. So, I hope this has helped you or helped you some of your family members.